This is African News Tonight on The Voice of America. Hello, welcome to Bio Africa. Thank you for joining us. I'm Douglas Mpuga, and here is what's coming up. All UNHCR operations in Sudan's neighboring countries impacted by this new emergency already have existing, um, existing large refugee and IDP populations and are also severely underfunded. That's UNHCR spokeswoman Olga Serrado on concern that Sudan's growing displaced persons crisis will continue to grow and spill over into neighboring countries that already are hosting large refugee populations. Also, another Kenyan pastor was arrested after deaths were reported at his church. And the Basketball Africa League got its latest round of games started yesterday. All this and more coming up on African News Tonight. Doctors Without Borders warns the healthcare situation in Sudan is on the brink of collapse and the situation may get worse if the fi- if fighting drags on. The UN says it appears the heads of the warring factions, General Abdel Fattah al-Burhani, head of Sudan's transitional government governing council, and General Mohamed Hamdam Daglo, Daglo known as Hamiti, leader of the paramilitary rapid support forces, do not seem inclined to talk. So we're, we're now entering um, the, the 11th day of the, the, the escalation of the current conflict in, in Sudan. Um, we have been in touch with Sudanese medical teams in Khartoum and other parts of the country where uh, wounded patients are being received. The situation in, in, in hospitals in, in Khartoum and other cities is, is extremely precarious. Um, the hospitals are extremely overstretched. They're running out of supplies. Um, in addition to problems of basic services such as electricity, water and fuel that's needed to run generators. The the staff that are in the the hospitals and other health facilities are exhausted. They've been working nonstop for the last 11 days. Um, Medical staff who are on duty um, cannot reach the hospitals to to go to work um, due to the intensity of the fighting. Um, In addition, health facilities themselves um, have been damaged by the by the fighting, um, damaged or in some cases completely destroyed. Um, As a result, very few hospitals are able to receive patients anymore in in Khartoum. And there are some reports of hospitals being directly targeted by by the shelling. Um, We we know that even before the, the, the current conflict, the, the, the health system in, in Sudan was already on the brink, but now the, the health system is on the point of collapse. Kate, and of course, healthcare is, is part of infrastructure, hospitals, etc. Um, what do civilians need right now? And, and what type of infrastructure that would affect how help gets in? Uh, how much of that infrastructure has been affected? So we're, we're assessing at the moment, um, MSF teams are assessing where and how we can begin to um, scale up a response to this crisis. And we continue to provide medical care in several locations. So at the moment, MSF supported facilities are continuing to treat patients in, in Damazin, Blue Nile, in Omdurman, Khartoum State, in Krenik and El Janina in, in West Darfur, in Rokero and Central Darfur, in um, um Rakuba in Gadarif states in, in East Sudan. Um, we, we know that uh, in other places, such as in El Afashir, um, we have continued to receive large numbers of wounded people at the hospital where we support. Um, our own teams have been working around the clock to treat the, the injured people. Um, so far, we have treated um, 389 people who have made it to the hospital, which is now the only functioning health facility um, in in El Fashir city um, in 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 North Darfur. So um, we we also know that the impact on the on the population has been absolutely immense. Um, we know that people cannot reach any of the health facilities. There are the few that still remain open due to the ongoing violence and the fear that they have for for their safety. Um, of course, we're hearing a lot of reports of diplomats fleeing. We're seeing those images. Um, what does this mean for MSF um, and other humanitarian organizations? Do you anticipate that you will be able to stay um, and will be allowed to stay to operate in the country? So um, 
we reiterate, um, MSF is extremely concerned by the, the, human, the medical humanitarian situation in, in Sudan. Uh, we remain committed to providing much needed vital health care to people in Sudan, especially during moments like these. Um, but to do so, we need to be able to ensure the security of our staff and our patients. Um, after over 10 days now of um, sheltering under heavy fighting, some of our teams have been relocating um, to a safer location. Um, and there are plans for, for some others of our, our teams to, to leave the country, but MSF is, is staying in Sudan. Um, we continue to keep in close contact with, with all of our team members uh, as far as possible. The, the security of our staff is a, is a top priority. Um, and we appreciate the support that we have um, received to be able to safely relocate um, our teams. Um, of course, we're extremely worried about our Sudanese colleagues, our, our patients and the, the civilians, the general population who are trapped in this conflict. Um, our thoughts are with them and we iterate our calls to the parties to the conflict to avoid um, civilian areas and to spare civilian lives in this conflict. And um, yeah, we, we call on the, all of those participating in the violence to ensure the safety of medical personnel and health facilities and to allow safe passage of our teams, ambulances and people seeking health care to facilitate the movement of all of those who are delivering vital humanitarian assistance in Sudan today. That's Kate Nolan, the Deputy Operations Director for Doctors Without Borders, or MSF. She spoke with VOA's Heidi Adams from her office in Nairobi. Reports emerged this week that a criminal-linked uh, Wagner group could be supplying weapons to one of the warring parties in the conflict in Sudan. Solomon Solmo- Salem Solomon has the story. New reports suggest that the Kremlin-backed mercenaries with the Wagner Group in Sudan may have offered weapons to one of the two rival Sudanese generals. But as violence rages in the country, high-level U.S. officials have expressed concern. John Kirby, National Security Council Strategic Communications Coordinator, said the group's involvement will only worsen the situation. Obviously, we don't want to see this conflict expand or broaden, and we certainly wouldn't want to see uh, additional firepower brought to bear. Uh, that will just continue the violence and continue to escalate the tensions. Two generals are fighting for power. General Abdel Fattah Burhan, head of the armed forces, and General Mohammed Hamdan Dogolo or Hemeti, the leader of a paramilitary group known as the Rapid Support Forces. Hemeti traveled to Russia last year and has sought to win support from Wagner. Jacqueline Burns is a senior political analyst with Rand Corporation. Hemeti and his rapid support forces are largely in control of the major gold mining regions in Sudan and have very likely been complicit in gold smuggling for years. Thus, the Wagner group is siding with the party they think is most likely to be able to continue to secure these interests, particularly in opposition to any civilian-led government. The Wagner group's history in Sudan dates back to the previous government of Omar al-Bashir. Wagner's leader, Yevgeny Prigozhin, had a close relationship with former autocratic leader al-Bashir. After al-Bashir relinquished power due to a popular uprising, Wagner continued to have a close relationship with the Sudanese military, particularly the paramilitary rapid support forces headed by Hemeti. It's a pattern analysts have seen before. Ben Dalton is a program manager at New America's Future Frontlines program, a Washington-based think tank. The Wagner Group does seem to engage with African countries on a pretty uh, predictable sort of pattern. Um, Normally, it starts with a cultivation of elites, or at least a subset of elites, um, and then that is followed up with a formal military technical agreement between the the states. Um, And this could be something like, you know, Russia will supply arms in exchange for concessions that allow them to do mining or other kinds of resource extraction. Since the fighting began in April, there have been unconfirmed reports saying that the Wagner fighters are supporting the RSF and supplying them with weapons and armor. Russia sees Sudan as a strategic location with vast mineral wealth and are eager to help install a friendly leader, says Cameron Hudson with the Center for Strategic and International Studies. We've seen a lot uh, in recent months about Russia's efforts to gain a, uh, a port on the Red Sea in Sudan through an official military relationship. Um, and they've signed other official military relationships with other countries in the region. Wagner's involvement in other parts of the continent, like Libya, the Central African Republic, and Mali, has in many cases been problematic, says Dalton. They've been associated with widespread atrocities. Everywhere they go, um, 
you see, you know, civilian deaths and um, various atrocities. Um, and, you know, Russia's interests are in extracting uh, the continent's resources so that it can strengthen its own position and build a web uh, to resist sort of international sanctions. They don't really have the interests of Africans at heart. And as the conflict rages, civilians continue to pay the price. Salem Solomon, VOA News. In Sudan, thousands of Khartoum residents are trying to leave the capital before the 72-hour ceasefire ends overnight. Reporter Sid Hamed Ibrahim has gone to the land port in Khartoum to talk with people trying to get public transportation out of the city. Here are some of the comments he collected. Alfredo Mohammed says he's traveling to the city of Kosti because of the insecurity in which Khartoum lives, and we have suffered enough. He lives in the Al Amarat neighborhood near armed clashes, but thank God for his short truce. He says tickets are very expensive and difficult to obtain. He waited several hours to get one. He has a car, but can't use it because there is no fuel. Shadia Abdel Rahman says she also is going to post him because circumstances have changed. She says they are living in insecurity, so they decided to leave because they have children who will go to some of our relatives in Kosti. Rahman says if the situation in Khartoum improves, they will return because our homes, cars, and other things are in Khartoum, so we are between two difficult choices traveling and staying. But they are worried about the expensive ticket prices and the risk that evacuees may be exploited on the road. The UN, United States, and many other governments are calling for the warring sides to extend the ceasefire to allow aid to reach civilians who have been living without electricity, food, water supplies for nearly two weeks. You're listening to African News Tonight. I'm Douglas Simpoga in Washington. Police in Kenya have arrested another pastor accused of indoctrinating followers with extremist The arrest of Ezekiel Odero comes as investigators find more bodies of members of the Good News International Church. The pastor of that church, Paul McKenzie, is accused of convincing at least 100 people to starve themselves to death. Mohamed Yusuf reports from Nairobi. Kenyan government officials have arrested a second pastor accused of preaching radical beliefs, leading to an unidentified numbers of deaths at his church in southeastern Kenya. Roda Onyancha is the Kenya Coast Regional Coordinator. We have arrested Pastor Ezekiel Ombok Odero of the New Prayer Center and Church at Mabuyeni in Kilifi County. On allegations of the deaths that have been occurring at his premises and reported in various uh, mocks or institutions. We've also taken action and closed down the prayer center going forward. So we are urging and giving information to the public that that prayer center has been closed down and whoever was in there has been cleared out. Interior Cabinet Secretary Kiture Kindiki said over 100 people were holed up in the church Thursday and are assisting the police with their investigation. Authorities did not say how many people died at the church or released their causes of death. Odero had claimed to work miracles and his church was believed to attract many people who were desperately sick. One woman who attended a different church led by Odero told VOA she did not hear about issues regarding fasting but said she saw people there who were very weak and were hopeful they will be cured. Jared Magolo is a lawyer representing Odero. He told journalists authorities have yet to file charges against the preacher. We have talked with the officers yes. and uh, 
They are doing their work, they are investigating, they will let us know what's going on. The arrest of Pastor Ezekiel comes a week after authorities uncovered mass graves in Shakahola Forest, where members of the Good News International Church starved themselves to death. Paul McKenzie is in custody for preaching that death by starvation would allow his followers to meet Jesus Christ. Investigators say the pastor will face charges of radicalization and terrorism. Omwanza Ombati, a Nairobi-based lawyer, says the director of public prosecutions must present a strong case against the preachers in order to obtain convictions. The standard of proof in criminal cases is beyond reasonable doubt. So for either Mackenzie or uh, Ezekiel to be convicted, the DPP must have watertight evidence. And remember that uh, there are many people who are, there are many deceased uh, persons who are involved in this, and each case is judged on its own. So it's, 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 a, it's a fairly complex case in terms of prosecuting, gathering evidence, uh, preparing charges, uh, processing crimes, the crime scene, and presenting a good case before a court of law. Kenyan security agencies have been blamed for failing to take action against churches and pastors who preach dangerous doctrines and exploit people. They are accused of moving too slow to save lives in Shakahola Forest, where most of Mackenzie's followers had gone to die. Ombati says the government must start following the activities of the places of worship and their teachings. The government must now crack the whip. Not only on Mackenzie on, or on Ezekiel, but on many other churches who have come out and who they've licensed and who are who are conducting very very bizarre, you know, sort of services or things like that. And you can see it in social media. Even people going to church and they they, they are told that there will be money that will come to your phones if you just wave your phone. I mean, very ridiculous and, and silly things. So if 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 the government is serious about it. It should crack out. It should crack on everybody who's uh, who's using religion on uh, the gullible masses. In the last seven days, at least 100 bodies of children, women, and men have been exhumed in the Shakahola forest. According to the Kenyan Red Cross, more than 350 people are still missing, as a search of more bodies and survivors continues in the coastal region. Mohamed Yusuf for VA News, Nairobi. <music> Peace talks between Ethiopia's federal government and the Rebo Oromo Liberation Army have started in Tanzania's semi-autonomous island of Zanzibar. The talks have raised hopes of ending years of violence and unrest between the two sides. Charles Kombe reports from Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. The talks that began Tuesday and are being mediated by Kenya and Norway came at a critical time for Ethiopia which has experienced the rise in ethnic tensions and violence in recent years. The discussions are receiving a generally positive reception, with many expressing hope they will ultimately bring an end to the prolonged period of conflict and instability in Ethiopia. Many analysts are closely monitoring the situation, including Abbas Molim, a lecturer at Tanzania Center for Foreign Relations. Molimu has been following the conflict, and says the talks are a step in the right direction, but that more needs to be done to achieve lasting peace and stability in Ethiopia. <inaudible> Molimu says this demonstrates they have recognized and felt enough impact, and now they need to come together and resolve the issues. He knows there will be a chance for success, but even greater success can be achieved if they choose to revisit the constitution and revise it to unify Ethiopia. He says the current constitution, which allows for regions to have their own governance, is what fuels the desire for separatism among the people. As tensions rise over the incorporation of regional military fighters into the National Army, Ibrahim Rahbi, a regional analyst, has suggested the Ethiopian government must carefully manage this process to prevent further conflicts. Rahbi says the Ethiopian government's move to integrate regional fighters into the national army has created a lot of tension, as each of the country's 11 regions has its own fully governed representatives, including armed forces. He adds that the government will need to find a way to work together by removing weapons from all regions at once. 
When asked for a comment, Charles Hillary, the chief spokesperson of the Zanzibar government, stated that the peace talks between the Ethiopian government and the OLA are being conducted behind closed doors, and they do not have any information about the ongoing meetings. He further clarified that Zanzibar is only providing a venue for the talks and is not part of the negotiations. The Ethiopian government's effort to negotiate peace with the Oromo Liberation Army have received a mixed reaction. While some applaud the talks as a step toward resolving the conflict, others, such as the American Ethiopian Public Affairs Committee, IPAC, have called for a guaranteed cessation of violence by OLA Shen before meaningful negotiations can take place. In a statement Wednesday, the IPAC said, negotiations cannot meaningfully take place while the population and many communities in Ethiopia still face the risk of attack by such forces. Primarily, there must be a guaranteed cessation of all hostile acts by OLA Shen, which has constantly committed crimes against humanity and engaged in the massacre of innocent and armed civilians. In recent years, the Romo Liberation Army OLA has grown in numbers, but some experts assert it lacks the organization and weaponry to pose a serious threat to the Ethiopian government. The Romo region has experienced ethnic violence, and while the government has accused the OLA of involvement, the group denies responsibility. The government's heavy-handed response to the conflict has only fueled bitterness among the Oromo people. Meanwhile, the talks are expected to continue for several days, and both sides have expressed their commitment to finding a peaceful resolution to the conflict. Charles Combe, for VA News, in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. The Nile Conference of Season 3 of the Basketball Africa League opened yesterday. Host Egypt's Al Ahle dominated Mozambique's Ferroviario de Beira 92-74 at the Hassan Mostafa Indoor Sports Complex in Cairo. VOS Jackson Mvungani wraps up the action. Al Ahle got the first point of the game up for nothing. But